So uh, welcome everyone again. Thank you for joining back again right on time. So as you are aware, we begin with our first session for today. Uh, the future of libraries is open ILS implementation and polio. And a speaker, of course, has already joined us, been kind enough to join us, although it's really early with his time. Uh, Mr. Sebastian Hammer, who's the co-founder and president Index Data, New Hampshire, USA. Uh, just a brief about uh, Dr. Sebastian. He is the founder of uh, co-founder of Index Data, a software company based in Denmark in US, and specializes in library software and community-centered innovation and product development. He's worked with library technologies for 30 years, collaborating with libraries, consortias, and service providers around the world. So he will take you through the entire folio platform and uh, ideally urge all participants to like have questions for him. You can put those questions on chat or you can ask him after his session. We want to make sure that this is an engaging session. We have him for 45 minutes for his session and after that we would want him to answer questions. So please have really good questions ready. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Sebastian. Over to you, sir. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can share yours if you have a PPT. Thank you very well. Thank you very much. Uh, and before I share my screen, I just want to say, say thank you very much to the leaders. I'm sorry. I just want to say thank you to the leadership of the Institute and the range um, for inviting me to speak and also to the delegates for your interest in, in the future of libraries and library technology. So let me share my screen and we will begin. So please let me know if you don't see my screen. So my, my goal here is to try to share a little bit about <clears throat> the background and the vision behind uh, the Folio Library Services Platform. This is a project I've been very intimately involved with in, in for the past uh, four or five years. And I hope to share some of the excitements and also leave you with some thoughts about what Folio could mean to you and to library professionals and to the library community in, in India in particular. Um, so let me begin, jump right into it. Um, uh, but first I wanted to share just a little bit of our background as a company, because I think it, it has a little bit of, of bearing and relevance to the project itself. Um, my company was started in 94. Uh, so it's been going on for now around 26 years. And uh, I started the company essentially because I had worked in library technology for a few years and I was had become really passionate about being involved in library and collaborative technology development projects um, of all different kinds as I worked primarily in the Danish library sector. And I wanted to do more of that. So we started the company with an eye towards participating in projects and building software. Um, we became very known in our early years for building middleware, <clears throat> essentially technology that would help uh, people developing library systems to make those library systems talk to each other. Um, so we created uh, software tools that we would release as open source software, uh, primarily because we didn't have a sales staff or sales team at the time. But we would release the software and people would find the software and they would contact us to ask us if we could help uh, them integrate it into their products. Uh, we would provide support for it. We would work together with uh, groups of libraries that were doing uh, interoperability projects of various kinds. And we did this for many years. Uh, in 2004, um, I moved to uh, the US from Denmark because I had, I had married an American when she, was, she wanted to go home at the time. So at that point, uh, Index Data began to transition into becoming a, a, a Danish American and international company. Um, our team gradually over the years became entirely virtual. So today we have a staff of 19 people uh, everywhere from Sweden to Australia. Um, we work virtually from home, all of us. Uh, so we did this even before COVID. Um, so in that way, uh, in that way, COVID has not changed so much for us. We are a mix of developers, uh, systems people, librarians, 
And that of our work again has been um, uh, to do, to create tools, to collaborate with people, uh, uh, to provide support for the tools that we've developed. Um, in particular, we uh, ended up uh, designing and building the core folio platform and in the initial set of apps, uh, uh, starting back uh, uh, around four or five years ago. Uh, we were also one of the first folio service providers and development partners for, for libraries and for companies and for others. Um, so I'd like to take you back a little bit at this point and to talk about the background for Folio and what, what led us to build it, how it is different from other library management systems and from, from Koha as well. Um, you will have seen, I believe, during the conference slides, much like this one, um, uh, probably a few of them even. There's a set of, of trends that impact libraries and have been impacting libraries now for several years, but in many ways are accelerating. Uh, and you'll see different variations of, of this slide and this list of, of trends. But in general, you see um, uh, in many countries, you see a pressure on the funding for higher education as, um, as the economy fluctuates. You see the cost of materials uh, increasing in many places, even as we have transitioned away from physical materials into uh, into uh, uh, electronic materials. You see rapidly evolving user expectations as faculty and students become used to consuming media from uh, commercial sources. You see an expectation that libraries are able to deliver a customer experience similar to those large companies. So there's pressure on, on the types of services that libraries uh, are expected to deliver. Um, so, you see new formats, you see delivery methods, you see the entire field of scholarly communication evolving as, as we've moved from print journals into online journals, into online forums of different kinds. You see pressure in the direction of open access publishing. You see everything changing and you see the role of the library being challenged. Um, but you also potentially see opportunities if, if, if libraries can put themselves in a position of reflecting on, on, on the role within the academy in terms of scholarly communication, in terms of serving the needs of researchers and scholars, in terms of potentially managing research data, in terms of influencing and participating in, um, in creating good education outcomes, there are opportunities for libraries as well. But since a lot of the services that libraries provide are mediated by technology in different ways. The technology landscape that underpins and support libraries is critically important. And there has been a set of trends affecting those as well. Um, so in particularly um, over the years, library technology has been characterized by really, really slow technology renewal cycles in general. I have found in my years of working in libraries that libraries are, and librarians are intellectually curious. They're fascinated by technology. They're interested in pushing the boundaries of what technology can do for them. But they are often frustrated and, and uh, flummoxed by a, a set of technology infrastructures that moves very, very slowly. Uh, it's been characterized by, by these large complex uh, procurements projects, contract negotiations, very slow and expensive migration, so that many libraries don't tend to upgrade their base technology uh, more than every 10 or 15, or even 20 years. Um, that, that has led to, to a relatively slow technology adoption cycle, which gets in the way of, of enabling libraries to react to these changes. There's also been just a massive consolidation of library technology vendors or companies um, we've gone from having a, a number of different companies competing, uh, many of them created by libraries, or by people from a library background over the years, competing with each other, trying to come up with new technologies and new ideas, to a consolidation where companies have acquired each other. Many of these companies have ultimately been acquired by organizations from outside of the library sector, by investment banks and the like. Uh, to the point where for academic libraries, 
we were very quickly approaching a scenario where they, there was essentially only one vendor left, Exlibris and their armor products. Um, and this caused some real concern. Um, the fewer companies you have, the less conversation, the less competition you have, the less conversation you have about what the future needs to be. If you end up with a single company uh, being the only option for academic libraries, then there's essentially a single team in that single company that's that really sets the direction for everybody. And that's a problem when libraries are trying to deal with all of these challenges and changes that take place. Um, the other big change, uh, and maybe even more disruptive in a sense, is that there's been a move away from locally operated library systems to things running in the clouds, to SaaS-based platforms. And in many ways, that's mirrored the emergency, uh, the, the emergence of these uh, large global platforms. Think about uh, uh, Google's Office platform, think about Facebook and so on, where single companies own some platform that attracts all of the users. It becomes very difficult to compete with something like that. It's hard to imagine that. Uh, at least in the United States, it's hard to imagine a, a, a serious competitor to Facebook emerging without some real large tectonic shifts. Um, so it tends to be a winner takes all scenario where everybody end up in a single platform. <clears throat> and the owners of that platform <clears throat> get enormous power. They end up with all of the data, they, the, 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 the data describing the, the um, use of behavior, the use of preference and so on, are all gathered in that one company. Um, so what ultimately happens is a sense that libraries end up outsourcing and losing control of their technology roadmap. Um, they end up having less of a say in, in the very infrastructure that a lot of their services are based on. And that causes concern for librarians and it causes concerns for smaller companies, other service providers that feel that they get squeezed out of the marketplace. Um, and that, that really lets us to, led us to the beginning of the conversation that, that became Folio essentially. So, excuse me, these are the, the founders that essentially came together to create the Folio platform. First of all, we had academic libraries. Um, there was a group of very large academic libraries in the US. <clears throat> Think of uh, the University of Chicago, Duke University, uh, um, and a group of around a dozen or so very large academic libraries that for years had been working on gathering requirements to build their own library management system. Basically, they felt that the, the marketplace had, had failed to deliver what they were looking for, and they were interested in developing a community-owned alternative. Um, they had struggled to make the project come together. Um, uh, they had gone down a technical avenue that left them in, in somewhat off, off a blind alley um, and felt frustrated, but still felt like they needed to move forward in some way. Uh, we had EBSCO Information Services. Uh, EBSCO is a, a, a content aggregator. They had originally uh, been in the business of selling uh, journal subscriptions to libraries as packages, uh, but had transitioned into selling a variety of, of services and data products, databases, uh, uh, journal packages to libraries. They were troubled by what they saw as, as trends in the library marketplace that would make it difficult for them eventually or in the long run to compete. Um, their main competitor was, was ProQuest, another large aggregator of content, who at the time was in the process of acquiring Exlibris, which had itself become essentially that dominant player in the library technology marketplace. Um, and then there was us. In some ways, the odd dug out because we're this tiny company with 20 people. Um, but we had spent many years at that time uh, arguing for open systems and for greater collaboration across organizations, across different groups, and the power of open source to power a different kind of conversation between different entities working together. Um, so the three groups, the three organizations essentially came together around the table and framed a vision for uh, a truly next generation of library systems, a library service platform. Um, so the founding vision of Folio 
ultimately through many conversations boiled down to just this, just these principles. Everything else kind of arose from this notion of having a true open platform owned by its community of stakeholders. And if you think about it, it really was set up to directly address the concerns that we saw in, in the collapse of the shrinking of the marketplace, as well as the move towards cloud hosted platforms. So let me, let me try to unpack a little bit what these, what this statement means. Um, by a true platform, we imagine something that is infinitely adaptable and flexible. We were thinking something at the level of an operating system on a computer or a smartphone, uh, something that could be turned to any purpose and could meet the needs of libraries and help libraries explore what their role would be in the future. Um, uh, that, that could be as flexible again as, 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 as the smartphone that you have in your pockets. Um, this is a big different from past library management systems, which were essentially built as monoliths, where all functionality is gathered into one place, uh, into one monolithic piece of software. And this, this essentially characterizes everything from Alma to Koha. Uh, we wanted to move away from that premise to something that was built around the notion of apps carrying out discrete functions together on a platform that could support any kind of functionality. Um, we wanted an open platform. So we wanted to get away from the notion that the owner of the platform gets to have all the fun, gets to have all of the power. Um, we wanted everyone to participate in the governance and the ownership and the development of that platform. We wanted the, the platform to be truly owned by its community. Um, so we wanted many voices guiding and governing the technology roadmap, not just one voice. Um, and we, we wanted a diverse group of stakeholders, libraries, service providers, uh, commercial companies, nonprofits, developers and librarians and so on to be at the table and to share in the conversation. Um, so we were inspired by successful large open source projects that have numerous stakeholders and, and, and become ecosystems essentially uh, that support the needs of many different kinds of organizations. Um, so that was the, the premise that we started with. And uh, from that, I want to go ahead and, and, and try at least to show you just a little bit of um, how Folio works and how we actually realized that vision. We're now uh, four years down the roads and we have uh, uh, more than a dozen libraries that have gone live or in the, in the, in the advanced process of going live already with Folio. So it's a living system um, based on that original vision. Um, so let me show you just a few things. This is not going to be a, a, an exhaustive um, demo of the system. I wouldn't have time for that, um, but I want to give you a little bit of flavor of the flavor of how we realized the vision that I, that I talked about um, and how we actually turned that into something that could solve everyday problems for libraries. Um, so uh, this is the, the homepage. And I mentioned the idea of modeling folio after smartphones. And essentially that is what you see manifested at the top of the screen. Let me just try to get rid of this little thing here that's in the way. Um, across the top of the screen, you essentially are seeing the apps that this user has access to. Uh, and the set of apps you will see will depend on who the user is. Uh, and again, this is the staff interface for Folio. So this is what librarians working in the library would see, depending on the tasks that they're going to do. Um, and this is about the full set of apps that have been developed at this point. Um, it includes the early set of apps that my team worked on way back in the beginning. Uh, and at this point, it includes also a set of apps that have been developed by community members outside from, from, from many different places at this point. Um, so let's look at one of the apps, uh, just as a starting point. Uh, the inventory app is one of the core pieces and one of the first apps that we built. Um, and it basically allows you to do uh, what it says. It allows you to maintain and look at the inventory of materials that you hold in your library. Um, so I can search, I can filter by different facets. Uh, if I look at one records, um, 
I can go in and look at, at, uh, at details of that record uh, in terms of bibliographic metadata, in terms of identifiers. I can also look at the individual items that are held in the library. So I can see I've got two items of this particular material. Um, one of them is checked out, one of them is available. Uh, if I wanna go see what's up with the material that's checked out, I can click on it um, and I can see that it is indeed checked out. Um, if I wanna see who actually holds it, I can click on here and it will show me the user that's checked out uh, this material. So as you can see, that's now sent me over to a different app. Uh, I'm now in the users app that allows me to see um, who my patrons are, uh, who my staff is, what sorts of permissions they have, whether they have uh, fees and fines, if um, uh, they've checked material out and so on. Um, I have, again, a series of different apps to serve very different purposes. And the initial focus, again, of Folio has been on meeting the core needs of library management, right? So we start with the idea of acquisitions so we have uh before you can buy anything you need to have budgets um not all libraries choose to manage uh their budgets within the library management system but if you do you have a nice connection between your materials and your budgets the money you spend and so on so folio allows you to maintain funds and ledgers uh, assign budgets to different purposes and once you do that, you can go ahead and you can purchase uh, material from different vendors. And again, what I wanna call your attention to is less the specific functionality and more the idea that functionality in Folio has been broken down into these apps and the apps all have a similar look and feel. There are, are shared functions in Folio that provide for a common look and feel common navigation across these apps, um, accessibility, uh, support for mobile platforms coming in and so on. So there's a, 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 a commonality to these, even though these apps have been developed by entirely different teams in many places with limited uh, coordination between them. And that was really the core idea of Folio as an app-based platform and what makes Folio fairly unique uh, compared to other systems out there. So once I have my, my finances in orders, I can deal with organizations. Um, I can create purchase orders. Uh, I can deal with invoices and so on. And uh, all of this together, once I have the material, I can go ahead and if a patron comes, I can check the material out, I can check it back in. Uh, so I have all of the core functions that I need to run my library, whether it's managing electronic resources, print resources, checking things out and checking things out. And what's interesting is the flexibility that we gain from, uh, from the app-based platform, because the library can choose just to run the apps that they are interested in. Um, they don't need all of these apps if, for instance, if they have no electronic resources or if they have no print resources, they don't need the apps to deal with, with, uh, with physical resources. They can just focus on electronic resource management. If they want to make the platform do something entirely different uh, or add some new functionality or some custom workflow specific to their library, they can create apps just to meet that purpose. They can extend the functionality for a, a folio without having to increase the complexity of the underlying platform. Um, and that was a really central element that these apps truly are independent as much as we can make them. Uh, um, every app that you add, adds a set of permissions that you can assign to staff members. Uh, every app can add a set of settings. So there's a common settings app uh, where you can go in and see all the different apps. Uh, so if I click on circulation, it will show me uh, different types of settings that I can set con uh, concerning uh, um, concerning circulation. I can see loan policies um, and go in and edit them, add new ones and so on. So every app adds its own settings, adds its own permissions. Um, and the intersection of my, my patrons and my users, there's, there's the staff rights and this set of apps allows me to do everything that I need in the in the library, but also gives me 
a really powerful way to um, manage flexibility, manage extensibility, allow me to adapt the platform to many different needs and to bend it to my shape, either in terms of how I configure it for an individual library or how I develop it for the future. That makes Folio extremely elastic. Um, for those of you who are, uh, who are engineers or come from a technical background, I've always been fond of this particular aspect of the settings. This will show me uh, the current versions of the apps that are running on the system. So I can see that this particular uh, instance of Folio is running 21 different apps. Uh, and these are the versions of those apps. But it also tells me that on the back end, on the server side, I'm running uh, over 100 different modules that provides um, services behind the scenes for those apps. So each app, if you will, that you see here on the screen is made up both of some user interface components and some server side modules that provide functionality for those for those apps. So in this case, I can see what apps I'm what apps I'm running on the front end and also what modules I'm running at the back end. And essentially the folio platform is what enables me to see and engage with these apps. Um, so I'd like to switch back now to uh, to my presentation. So I can talk a little bit more about the the architecture and the model of these uh, of these apps and how they're implemented. Um, so first of all, as we discussed, the apps have a common look and feel. They have common navigation. They have common search characteristics. Uh, they all work in a similar way. That's thanks to. Uh, a shared toolkits that developers use when they want to develop new apps. So the apps are independent, uh, app one, app two, app three here, and they share a toolkit that we call Stripes, uh, and it provides all of these shared functions um, and enable those apps to look similar. On the back end, on the server sides, there is a tool called Okapi which essentially serves as a gateway to the set of web services that are provided by these backend modules that I referred to before. So typically each app might have a corresponding backend module. It doesn't have to be just one, it could be many different modules. Um, but a copy is responsible for regulating access to those modules. Uh, so it will only allow an app from the front end to contact the backend module if the library has activated that particular module and if the user that is sitting at the console has access to that particular backend module. Um, those backend modules can also call on other modules. There might be shared modules that provide common functionality. Um, and that traffic is also regulated, regulated by Okapi. So Okapi is kind of the traffic cop that makes sure that people only access the functionality that they have access to. Um, it implements permission, it implements um, uh, instrumentation and logging, so you can see what's going on if you're running the system. Um, and in addition to that, these apps are drawing on common infrastructure, essentially. So each app is free to store data in whichever way it wants, but for practical purposes, it's helpful if, if they use some common infrastructure to make it easier to host um, uh, Folio for service provider. So most apps in Folio use Postgres as a uh, as a data storage. Although apps are entirely free to store things in the cloud or to store things in some other way, that's fine. We use containers as a way to to package and bundle these backend modules so they're easy to operate in a cloud based environment. Um, and in fact, I think one of the most important aspects of the Folio architecture is the idea that it is very lightweight. Although the purpose was to create what we described as an operating system or metaphor for the smartphone, uh, there are very few components that make up the Folio architecture. In fact, Stripes and Okapi are the two main ones. And Stripes is based on a, a standard um, web toolkit, uh, uh, React it's called, which is one of the, the major tools that people use to build uh, websites these days. And Okapi is similarly built on, on backend uh, components to make it fairly lightweight. 
Uh, so there are, are relatively few parts that make up Folio's architecture. And people on the back end are free to use whatever technology that they would like to implement their back end logic. So most of Folio is built in, in Java, but there are at least a couple of other back end technologies and used by different people building uh, business logic for Folio. And as long as you can put your back end logic into uh, containers, then it becomes very easy to host all of these components together. So when we thought about the architecture from the beginning, we wanted that lightweight, we wanted a low barrier of entry for people wanting to bring their own technologies and their own preferences of development practice into Folio, while also providing the means of having a common look and feel for, uh, for everybody. Um, and that's where we've ended up. That's what Folio's at. Um, again, I think the most critical aspect of the architecture is the notion that functionality is sliced into smaller units, often focused on some specific business area or some specific type of business objects. So think about your patrons or your users, think about your, your library holdings, think about your, uh, the organizations you need to deal with or your purchase orders. Each of these is, is an individual app. And you can, you can route and manage your workflows by directing people at uh, the individual apps that they need to work with to solve the, the, the task that's in front of them. Um, so that's the idea. That's how we, we put Folio together from a technical perspective. Well, that's where it's at from a, from a functional perspective. Just as important, however, as the, the architecture and the technology, and in some ways more important, is the idea of the the community organization, the way we've structured the community uh, to guide the roadmap of the software and the ways that you can engage with that community. And I'd invite you to think about the organization in, in two different orientations, if you will. What I, I tried to kind of capture it here, there is a, a, a kind of lateral organization that looks at the collaboration of different organizations that are co-investing. And there's a, 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 a vertical uh, collaboration that describes or captures the idea of different groups, different groups of stakeholders within organizations and across organizations that are collaborating. Um, so if we begin with the idea of, of, of lateral collaboration, the idea here is to have the roadmap and the software owned by not just one organization, but by many. Um, so how do you make that happen in practice? Open source is a key enabler of making that happen. You often, when you talk about open source software, you think in terms of, well, what is the cost of it? Who's going to maintain it? Uh, is, it about, is it about politics or is it about uh, uh, saving money? Uh, from my perspective, the primary purpose of open source software and using open source software licenses and folio is to enable collaboration, deep collaboration and open collaboration across institutional and organizational boundaries. So the, the notion is that we all own this software together. Physically, the, the intellectual property, the copyright of the software that we create is held by a neutral, a, a nonprofit entity that was created for the purpose called the Open Library Foundation. And um, its only job is essentially to, to, to hold the license. So no EBSCO index data, the libraries, we don't own the license, but we all have equal rights to make use of the software, to extend it, to build on it, to build our business on it and so on. And that's a key aspect of the organization. Um, sustainability is realized by having companies that are motivated like EBSCO and like index data to continue to develop and to support the software and to evolve it and to provide services. So it's a key element of this that libraries that wish to use Folio can run it themselves. If they have IT staff, if they have an interest in developing the, the skills in-house to, to run and maintain the software, they can. But the expectation really is that not most libraries will not choose to do this for themselves. So it's critical that there's an ecosystem of service providers that can run the software for you. 
sometimes it's run by it might be run for you by a consortium or by a larger library or by a commercial company and we want to see a multitude of different organizations providing services for folio um but again i'd say the critical part is this notion that we are all co-investing in the creation of the software we own the roadmap we own the strategic direction of the software together and we engage in an open conversation about where the software is moving and that is a a, a direct res response in a sense to that sense of peril of concern that the whole library community has had about the shrinking and the collapsing of the technology marketplace essentially we're responding by saying let's turn it let's disrupt essentially the whole conversation and make make the ownership of the technology something that is shared and owned by all of us in terms of the organization of the project um uh, in terms of that sort of uh, the vertical uh, uh, collaboration from the top, there is strategic leadership. And I think it's it's critical in projects of this nature that there is a, an ongoing engagement of strategic direction and strategic vision that, that guides a project. That we think about what are the trends, what are the challenges that are facing libraries, how can Folio help meet those challenges, how do we resource the project, how does Folio relate to other projects out there, whether it's Koha or Alma uh, or something else. That strategic leadership is provided by the Community Council, and it's worth noting that the Community Council is a new invention. It replaces essentially a, a tripartite stakeholder group that was made up of the initial three founding stakeholders of Folio. Um, it was realized that Folio has reached the level of maturity where participation and strategic leadership needs to be open to everybody. So the community council is now made up of, of um, elected people from across the projects. Uh, it's no longer run um, in a dictatorial way, if you will, by the initial founders. Under the strategic leadership group, the community group, the community council, we have the product council, which essentially is responsible for owning um, for owning the roadmap. Uh, so they prioritize high level functions and features, um, think about the resourcing and how we how we manage and, and make decisions about the timeline of development together. Uh, there are multiple groups of subject matter experts that ultimately de determine the functional specifications. In many cases, they work together with uh, UX experts. Um, I found it really compelling to organize requirements gathering around a, an exploration of the user experience. Uh, so in many cases in Folio, we have designed user interfaces before we design business logic. Uh, and we'll have librarians working together with UX experts to design interfaces, and then the developers will take those wireframes and designs and determine the best way to implement that functionality in code. Um, and finally, teams of developers uh, uh, design and build the actual software. And for the first year and a half of, uh, of Folio's life, most of those developers came from index data. Today, uh, though, the developer community is, I think, close to 100 developers. Some are, are contributed by libraries or by groups of libraries. Uh, many, many are funded and contributed by EBSCO, for which they deserve a huge recognition and thanks. Um, Index Data is still heavily involved and uh, investing heavily of our own time and money to, uh, to help complete Folio. Um, but that's the that's the the, the 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 building of the software and and that at the very high level is is essentially how the the, the community is organized but it's not the only way to engage right so so there is this core community that sets and manages the roadmap of the software and and that's critical and it's important it's what's built the majority of the software that you see and that i demonstrated um and that essentially can be viewed as a shared resource pool but as the project grows, as the community grows, we have always expected that there would be multiple different ways of engaging, that the community is not one monolithic thing. Um, and so we've already seen individual libraries coming to the table and say, hey, I like Folio, I like the roadmap, but I have this one 
bit of functionality that I really need for my library. Um, so those libraries would either develop internally or sponsor the development of some new piece of functionality on an entirely new app. And because Folio is built around this app model, it's very easy for a library to come in and say, I want to build this app and it's not going to upset everybody else it's not going to change some complex shared database model or some complex shared business logic because the apps are relatively independent teams can work very independently and that makes the community scalable in that way so some very critical bits of functionality has built uh, has been built outside of of that mainstream um uh, that mainstream roadmap. For instance, index data worked with a, a small group of, of small size libraries in, in the US to build a cost reserves app to help manage materials set aside for use in university courses. Um, index data worked with another group of libraries to implement integration with OCLC, uh, uh, a large national library utility in the US. And there are several other examples of individual libraries building functionality that they need for themselves. Um, very interesting or critically, uh, uh, the EIM, the Electronic Resource Management apps in Folio, were largely built by a consortium of German libraries um, that came together and said, we need to have EIM prioritized higher than the mainstream community is growing. So we're going to just start building these things. Um, and they essentially took it on themselves to build a set of EIM uh, apps for Folio. And that's become the mainstream thrust of how EIM is handled in Folio. Um, and it's worth noting that it's entirely possible for different groups to have different visions about how some bit of functionality is perceived. That doesn't have to be just one inventory in Folio. That doesn't have to be just one approach to e-resource management. It's quite possible for some other organization to come along and say, we have a different vision for how to do this. We will build another app. So just as there are lots of different apps on your on, available for your phone to build calendar functionality or to build whatever you can think of in Folio, it's entirely possible to have different visions of how to realize the same functionality, perhaps adapted for different scales of, of organization and so on. Um, so again, a really critical aspect of the architecture itself. Um, finally, as, as in some ways, maybe the most extreme example of, of the idea that you can engage in multiple different ways, um, there was a group of library consortia specializing in uh, interlibrary loan in the US that decided that they wanted a new interlibrary loan platform. Uh, the interlibrary loan technology marketplace has suffered a similar kind of collapse and shrinking to the, the library automation marketplace more generally. And so a group of, of organizations came together, including index data, and said, we want to build a new resource sharing technology platform. We're going to reuse the Folio platform. We, we will use that same operating system and we will build a new set of apps to support that specific area. So in a sense, we formed a sister community or companion community that, that uses the same infrastructure. And we actually use a couple of the Folio apps too, but we've built a whole new set of apps specifically to support the needs of libraries doing interlibrary loan. One that can work and be integrated with any library, not just Folio. Um, so it's easy to imagine, I think, other examples where people might use the platform in that way. So the thought I wanted to leave you with at the end here is the idea that Folio really set out to fundamentally disrupt how we talk about library technology, to take the ownership of technology platforms away from that very rapidly shrinking group of, of technology companies and to make it common property. Um, so to establish an open dialogue where libraries and technology work together. And we also really wanted to inspire uh, the formation of, of local and global ecosystems of service providers and libraries collaborating and working together. So it, it, what I'd love to see is, is the idea of 
of different groups coming together, looking at the platform, saying we can use this, this has value for us, but we also want to be part of the larger conversation. And to give you the notion that there are multiple ways of being part of that conversation. So for instance, we've seen in Germany already a really strong community rising up where there are uh, national meetings uh, where people come together, there are conferences where people teach each other the, how to use Folio, how to develop for Folio. Uh, they have their own sets of development priorities. Um, what might it look like for something similar to arise in India? Um, you can come to the, the initial founded, the initial community in the US. Um, you will find the time zones awkward. Uh, you may have to get up really early or stay up really late. Um, but it's entirely possible to say, we want to be part of this community, but we are going to organize our own centers of excellence. We are going to encourage the formation of our own ecosystem of service providers based here in India and to establish collaborations and, and, and try to seed innovation and new development here and to start a conversation about what you need library technology to do for your libraries. Um, if the technology is, is flexible, if you can have a conversation about the challenges that faces the libraries you work in, the organizations you work in, in the context of a software project that is open and lively, where you can engage with lots of other organizations that are thinking about the same challenges and engage in collaboration operations across different organizations, what would you make it do? What could you imagine your library thinking about doing in terms of providing services for its patrons if technology isn't setting boundaries, but technology becomes a partner for you? Um, so to me, that has been, has always been what is so exciting about Folio, that it's elastic, it's malleable that there are many way, different ways of engaging. And, and it's been exciting for me to see the EO Institute picking up and adopting Folio. And I very much hope that that is just the beginning of, uh, of a whole journey that can involve multiple different libraries and multiple, ultimately multiple different types of organizations in India uh, and that we'll see you at the table individually as developers or librarians but also as libraries and as a, a national community participating in, in the larger conversation. Uh, there are, are so many different ways that you can approach this. So if I've sparked a little bit of imagination or excitement about what the possibilities might be, then, then I've more than done my job here. Um, so that's essentially what I have. Um, I hope I've stimulated your interest and, and curiosity and, and the links at the bottom of the screen are places where you can go and, and, and look for more information and look for how to engage. Um, but really the conversation for you starts, starts here. So with that, I'll say thank you very much to all of you and I'll stop sharing my screen.